you can see it here, the 25% club has been uh, only reached twice so far uh, by, by two Korean groups, and I think MIT was involved in this point as well. The, the current record is at 25.2%. Uh, we don't know exactly what these last points are because they aren't published yet, but um, usually current records or very high performances that go beyond 20%, they use mixes of everything, mi mixtures of uh, cations, uh, the role is, is debated in literature, but uh, still it contains a lot of uh, mixtures, like be it uh, potassium, rubidium, cesium, methyl ammonium, or formamidinium, all of the mixed mixtures of uh, tin and lead are being tested at the moment as well. Although for the records, uh, only at the moment lead is being used, but also mixtures of uh, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Although the main mixture at the moment is bromine and iodine. You can see here, uh, like uh, how they achieve these very high performances also for uh, the tandem with silicon devices as well, which now stand at 29.1%. Uh, and these mixtures, they, they cause a lot of complexity as well. You see it here, that's the Pascal triangle saying that um, each new component doubles the possibilities. Um, and so only using the components that I've listed uh, previously, we have over 651 possibilities to make new materials. And now, of course, it's a big mess. Uh, here you can see this list being written down, how do we deal with this complexity? How can we get a stable baseline based on all of these uh, possibilities? And uh, on top of that, there are numerous deposition methods as well. You can go from chemical bath deposition, spin coating, dip coating, doctor blading, and so on. And all of these methods work. I mean, there's uh, literally uh, a reference for each of these methods. Uh, and each of these methods needs individual optimization as well. So if you come into the seminar and you think, great, now I can simply use the 25 for the 20% recipe and, and use it on slot die casting, you'll be disappointed. Because uh, what we use in the lab is usually spin coding, because it's uh, easy, flexible, and inexpensive for our purposes. Of course, there are the dangers of upscaling and so on, but that's a separate topic, which is also uh, like um, answered by separate groups as well or the same groups even, but it's a different challenge. So usually in order to keep like experimental flexibility, we are only talking about spin coding with, uh, within the next uh, step. And you can see it here, in order uh, to process, uh, many steps are needed. Um, and I'll just say it very briefly, uh, there are compact layers uh, or mesoporous layers of TiO2, passivation layers, there's the perovskite deposition itself, the charge selective layers, um, a whole transporter often, and the metal contact. So there are many different steps, and all of them must work perfectly in order to have a functioning device. But at the same time, each of these steps uh, has a certain likelihood to go wrong. So there, some of them are very error sensitive. So what do we do? How can we deal with this complexity? Many, many different deposition methods, many different processing steps, many possible perovskites. How do we, how do we deal with this? And that's where we get to. Um, sort of the idea of the paper that I'm presenting. Um, this problem also exists in other fields as well. There are journals called Nature Protocols or Nature Methods, mainly in the life sciences, that often suffer from a reproducibility crisis. So in these journals, only the how-to is being reported. You know, so there's a stringent reporting uh, needed, and that's why these journals exist, because that scientific community otherwise uh, would be in a crisis, because it's very difficult for uh, life exper experiments in the life sciences with like a live bacterial cultures to reproduce the results. So having a manual is not optional in those fields. It's a very important thing to get credibility. So th there's a discourse, that's what I'm trying to say, in a different research community, which already maps a lot of uh, what we are trying to achieve here as well. Unfortunately, it's not, it's not so common for perovskites. We are not doing this. And often in the perovskites, you can see it here, that's sort of the methods and the preparation section often from uh, papers like three or four paragraphs. I mean, I, I, I talked for almost 20 minutes, you know, and said how complicated it is and all of that. And all of this complexity is written down in three or four paragraphs usually. So that's sort of the culture in our field. It's traditionally rather short. It, it is maybe sufficient for some people, like for the skilled user, whatever that is, these kind of uh, hints and recipes can be sufficient, but it is for many insufficient to reproduce the results. And so how can we marry these two cultures? Let me click uh, a slide for before. Like how can we get to these nature protocols or nature method style uh, papers away a little bit from, from these very short paragraphs? And uh, that gets me to the next part. There, ha there have been efforts in the past as well 
So, for example, the fabrication of thin film DSCs above 10% was one uh, publication by Sego Ito, well-known scientist in the DSC and perovskite field. And um, based on this, uh, we, we tried to come up with a new idea on how to make over 20%, so we doubled up the efficiency at least, um, efficient perovskite solar cells in regular, and NI, uh, in, in regular NIP and inverted PIN architectures. So it follows this tradition or idea of protocol papers. But there are very few outlets in our field that accept these works. We couldn't, for example, send it to Nature Protocols or Nature Methods because it's not the life sciences. There are very few journals that have a space for this. Chemistry of Materials, for example, is one of them, publishing it as a methods and protocols paper. And now some people say, well, it's only methods and protocols. It, 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 we don't need it. It's just an optional thing. We may even give away our secret or something like that. But in order to move the field forward, uh, this is not the correct kind of thinking. By having reproducible results, we can start thinking of different uh, research. It's just uh, sort of like uh, leveling the playing field in terms of um, the device preparation, but in the long run, the field uh, like benefits from having um, like a common standard for the production of the devices as well. And in this case, the methods and protocols were very beneficial for us. So we were able to publish it and we got a lot of uh, citations for it as well. So there's an individual benefits, and I'm trying to encourage everybody here as well to publish these methods and protocol papers. So they shouldn't see, they shouldn't be seen as second-rate papers because they get like uh, full full-rate citations, let's say. So you should really pay attention to this. This paper is only like uh, two years old, maybe, and um, it's already got 150 citations, showing that there is really an interest in it. So you should feel encouraged, even in the currency of science you do get the citations as well. And that's also to say there's an editor's uh, workshop afterwards. You should also consider this in the future as well. So let's dive into it, uh, into the fabrication section. Um, you can see here, so this is all coming from this paper now here. We're only talking about this paper from now on. Um, that's the outline within the paper. So if you down, uh, download it, you can find it. Uh, you can find it. There's a lot of... Um, detail on every single step, the perovskite precursor solution, the substrate cleaning. How should you clean the substrate? Yeah, I mean, for those who, who wash the dishes at home, you know there are many different methods and they matter. Yeah, the dishes are uh, clean depending on how you clean them, you know. Like there are different grades of cleanliness as well. And it's the same for, for the substrates as well. If you're not careful, maybe you leave some of the adhesive, uh, like the washing liquid, and it changes the dynamics afterwards. The bottom selective contacts, both for the uh, regular and inverted structure, uh, the film deposition itself, uh, the top selective contacts, and so on and so forth, and there are videos as well. So let me show you some of the detail. We discussed uh, all the main architectures in literature. We discussed the planar regular NIP, the mesophorus, which is at the moment producing uh, both the most stable and most efficient solar cells as well, and the planar inverted. So I'm going to focus only on the mesophorus. That's the one that uh, we use most commonly. And so I'm going to focus on this. But there's also the detail for the other two architectures as well. And all of them uh, like by labs, which were producing more than 20% reproducible results. So first of all, what was very important about this paper was to have a chemical inventory to say which chemicals we have used. Chemicals matter. They have different uh, additives. They have different purity. And even it can matter from which vendor you get them. The most famous example in perovskite research is maybe the, um, the, the methyl ammonium and former mandinium salts. They are very hygroscopic depending whether you synthesize them yourself or where you buy them. They have uh, different properties. So if you ever leave your um, methyl ammonium like in an open vial overnight, you can even see on a microbalance that the weight is increased because it's sucked in water. It's a very good desiccator, a desiccant in a way, one can say. So you should take care of it. So, uh, and you should try to normalize it. And we wrote down, we bought it here from a company. I don't, I don't want to name drop it. Uh, you can find it in the paper. But uh, this is important because even if there is a little bit of water within that chemical as well, at least it's reproducible from that company. So you don't have to worry about it anymore. When, when we started perovskite research, everybody synthesized their own methyl ammonium or form ammonium. And so the, it was a little more random. So you should try to normalize at least uh, your basis the ingredients for your recipe should all be the same for everybody. So try to make sure to, to have like a fixed inventory. Don't change your vendors all the time. And don't necessarily, I mean, be a little conservative, I would say, in, in this respect. 
try to experiment, but also try to have your fixed baseline with your chemicals as well. We always try to use uh, dry solvents as well. We all know that water plays a huge role when preparing perovskites as well. And the storage and processing was always conducted in an inert atmosphere as well. The, I mean, by definition, if you ever go to your weather report, you can see how the humidity every day changes. If you do your experiments in a changed uh, humidity environment, it means you're doing it in a random environment. I mean, maybe it's fine, maybe your, your um, compounds can survive it, but you should at least be aware of it. If you do it in atmosphere, it can change every day. If you believe your system is sensitive to everyday humidity change, then you need to think of an alternative for it. Either you try to make your chemicals more robust against humidity, or you try to do the entire processing within the glove box, although it's very painful. But that's in order to ensure you, ca you have reproducible conditions. The next point is how to prepare the perovskite pre the precursor itself. So these are very complex uh, compounds. You, you can see it here on the left. You can even buy it from some vendors. It's this yellow liquid. These are mixtures of uh, like um, alkali metal um, uh, halide salts, former medinium salts, and um, that iodide or that bromide uh, precursors. And often what we do for, for let's say, double cation or triple cation perovskites, we use a stock solution of PBI2. You see it here at the bottom. We wrote down exactly how you need to dissolve it in a four to one solution of DMF and DMSO. And then we add the FAI to it afterwards in order to have a stock of FAPBI3. And this stock, we mix it with MAPBBR3 in a five to one ratio. So you have like 16% of the other one. And th that's what we experimentally over hundreds of and thousands of devices we found as our sort of like go-to strategy. And you can see here, we kept the uh, organic chemicals in a, in a stock solution in uh, DMF and DMSO, PBI2, PBBR2, cesium iodide, rubidium iodide. And here there's an example how we dissolved them. We kept these because we believe uh, that the inorganics can be kept uh, for a long time without degrading. So some people also in the review of this paper were saying maybe keeping the PBI2, we heated it, for example, as well as a mistake. To us, we didn't know about this. Keeping an inorganic salt in a stock solution sounds like a very reasonable thing to do. Now, there are other people who say to us, this is a surprising new step. And that's exactly why we are writing this paper. So we can have this discussion because usually, you know, if somebody tells you make an omelet, I mean, some people will simply make it and others will ask, what, what are the ingredients? How do I break an egg? You know, and uh, it's good to have this kind of like very small discussion. And here, some people say having this kind of stock solution for us is an interesting new step. And perhaps if this really makes a huge difference on the device reproducibility in the end, this could be a good research topic for you. If you really find that this makes a huge chemical difference, this can be a very rewarding and highly cited paper afterwards. So please pay attention to all these details. And we are very happy we don't see it as like uh, a backtracking of our previous work. We see it as an important uh, addition to the research community, even this small step, if it uh, makes really such a big difference, because we make it visible and we invite everybody else to make it uh, as visible as well. You can see here on the right hand side, the table on how to prepare these uh, um, completed precursors with the organic salts as well. So the uh, organic salts, we don't heat them. We simply add the inorganic stock solution to them afterwards. So we have FAPBR3, MAPBB, BR3, and then also these quadruple and triple cation is in there as well. Um, precursor solutions. And again, we are writing down numerical examples on how we mix them. Here you can see um, we're going through the step by step. So one step is to put the compact layer. So I just showed how to prepare the, pre uh, the precursor. But here the step is uh, to put the compact layer and then afterwards the mesoporous layer. Uh, you need to find a good routine for the spray paralysis. And we have a video on this. So I'll show you. One second. So here uh, we are taking a precursor for TiO2 and we are spraying it on a, on a very hot, hot plate. And again, with these videos, they, they are not perfect. We are not like professional filmmakers or something, but you can see here the spray no nozzle. It's, uh, there's oxygen going through and then you have these uh, substrates and they are, um, they are exposed to this uh, spray every few seconds. So you need to find your own technique here. And uh, then it forms anatase TiO2. So that's a very small layer of, uh, a very thin layer of uh, TiO2 compact, and that's needed in order to prevent recombination. And here, that's a very manual step. You need to learn how to deposit it. So that's a, a big error source often. 
So I'll interrupt the video here and go back to the presentation. And the, after the compact layer, a mesoporous layer we, is, is being put. This mesoporous layer of TiO2 has like organic uh, additives in there as well. And there's a heating uh, procedure for it as well. You, we go all the way up to 450 degrees in order to create a mesoporous layer. As we burn out the organic additives within this material, there's a lot of mesoporosity. And that's a step that is sort of uh, a development uh, from the disensitized solar cells as well. But that's con kind of what we're using here in this particular step. And there afterwards, now we're getting to this step, um, I talked about how to prepare the precursor. The precursor then needs to be put on the mesoporous um, substrate, the, the substrate that has a mesoporous layer on top. And that's a very tricky step because while the precursor is spinning, an anti-solvent is dropped from the top. I'll show a video after, after I'm going through the slide. But that's a very tricky step. It's very manual and it requires uh, practice. So a lot of people say, I made one batch, it doesn't work, so it means nothing works. Okay, but that's exaggerated. Uh, I always say you need to make maybe at least a thousand devices or a hundred devices to get experience. How to hold your hand, how to drop the anti-solvent. This is a very manual step. Of course, it's frustrating and we want to automize it. But on the other hand, if it was completely automizable, maybe it wouldn't be science anymore. You know, like uh, there's a trade-off. One can say if it's particularly hard, it also has at least a prospect to be new research as well, because otherwise everybody could do it. But especially the anti-solvent step, I can say, requires a lot of um, a lot of uh, patience as well, and it's difficult to describe, and that's why you often don't find it in the paragraphs of papers. I mean, it's sort of telling you how to, in which speed to put your thumb or, or your index finger, depends on the person, uh, on the pipette, and which with which uh, speed to drop the anti-solvent. That decides how the film quality comes out. And it's a very manual stop and, uh, step, and it's difficult to describe. And that's why it's so important to make it very open, let's say, that this is a step we need to work on. It's also maybe a good uh, reason why we should try to go away from the anti-solvent in the long run. Mm. I'll, I'll show you the video afterwards, but first, uh, afterwards, we deposit a whole transporter. It's usually spiroometat. We put in this table all the different additives. It's CBP, lithium, TFSI, FK207, which is uh, uh, to oxidize the spiro. And then afterwards, we put the metal contacts here. I want to warn. Uh, heating is a problem and you need to be extremely careful not to overheat during your uh, evaporation your, your devices. We know that heating uh, makes the metal contact go all the way into the perovskite degrading it. So then let, let me show you the video on the um, anti-solvent first. See it here in a second. So you can see here, this is the usual dirtiness in a glass box. <laughs> you have the substrate, you put it on, on the spin coder. This is all in the paper and the supplementary. You need to clean it with the air gun. That's also not something you would write in a paper to get some dust off. You put the precursor, this yellow liquid, prepared in the way that I've shown earlier. It rotates for a certain amount of time. You'll see in a second. And while it's rotating, I'll skip ahead. You see it here. While it's rotating, the anti-solvent is dropped from the top. And then how to hold your hand and how to keep it still and stuff like that, that's exactly what depends from person to person. You see it here, that's the anti-solvent, chlorobenzene usually. Anisol works too, it's less toxic. Yeah, you see here now, and this was a very fast step. And it, they went very close to the substrate. There's a lot of experience in this particular step. And it's difficult to translate what exactly was done here. But that's sort of what requires practice, practice, and practice. A very sensitive step, just so you know. So don't be surprised if, if it's hard for you. It's hard for everybody, essentially. And then afterwards, it's removed and put on a hard plate. I'm not going to show that here. So then um, we're almost finished. So that's the video I've shown you just now. And reproducibility, that's the last step. So you try to meticulously stick to the protocol you develop, but you also need to accept there is no bad data. Try to record all the data that you that you have, not just the good data. The bad data also tells you something about the process. If it's very difficult to make reproducible devices, it means there is some step which is particularly sensitive. And here you can see it over the course of three or four years with thousands or almost 10,000 of devices, we managed to 
improve the protocol here in the beginning very few devices were made and then at the end more and more breaking this 20 percent barrier eventually and it was only possible through teamwork through using a lot of people who used the same process trying to report faithfully what they have done and then eventually people really achieve these very high results also as you can see here a lot of experiments do not work so this is all the experiment the experimental data also with test variables which didn't work like certain kinds of treatments and so it also shows you that the same device is not necessarily the same device so when two people say we did exactly the same it doesn't mean they really did the same because it depends on what the glove box was like maybe some person was working after another person who exposed the glove box to a lot of anti-solvent and so it's not the same condition anymore and this you can only debug by reporting the data the metadata so to speak in a dream world or maybe it can be done in, a, in the future a glove box which records everything you know like a system maybe a, this is a thing for a vendor this metadata could come out and tell the next user what the condition of the glove box is so that would be a good idea but if you don't have that which is the case for most of us uh, you can report to each other like one experiment uh, experimentalist after the, the next and this also helps you to find key hidden parameters we found that the temperature of the glove box was very important by accident because on one winter day we left uh, the door open or the window and then it was very cold and so we realized that the temperature during the processing was particularly important and we hope that this work can be a new reporting standard or like the, the starting point we don't think we necessarily made a very good job at it but it was a starting point uh, we hope it can be um, it can be used in the future as well like for something like nature perovskite methods or something like that and um, this work did get noticed uh, by uh, brandon sutherland who's also sitting here in the audience somewhere uh, there in the back uh, the arcane magic of high performance solar cells he called it where he pointed out this article as well you can see it here you know so that's maybe the feeling that a lot of us have <laughs> at 2 a.m in the night how do we get from two percent to 20 only 18 more to go and uh, what i liked about this um, article was the last sentence one can hope that this is the start of a trend towards not only more methods papers but increased experimental procedure robustness uh, broadly across the field. And I think that's a very nice, uh, nice sentiment. Uh, and, and hopefully in the future, there will be more of these methods and protocol papers and more venues like these where it can be presented to a broader audience.